Hey, hey, what's up you amazing hackers? My name is the XSS Rat and today I'm going to prove to you why that is my name. First of all, we're going to talk a lot about cross-site scripting in this one, so let's talk about the agenda first, shall we? What actually is cross-site scripting? Well, you will be surprised because a lot of people think cross-site scripting happens predominantly in JavaScript, exclusively in JavaScript even. You're wrong about that. A lot of people think that cross-site scripting is all about HTML tag injection. You're wrong about that. Um, and there's so much more we'll talk about. So we'll talk a lot about those contexts that we just talked about. We'll talk about the types of cross-site scripting. We'll only go over reflected, stored and DOM in this video. I know that there are a lot more, but I advise you to do your own research on those. And how to test for cross-site scripting. This is going to be the most important part, of course, because this is going to be the cross-site scripting methodology a little bit. And then a lot of you have probably encountered these filters in the wild. You might be wondering, okay, how do I get around them? Well, we'll talk a little bit about that as well. And raising your impact, the most important thing. If you're unable to do that, it's not even useful to look for cross-site scripting. So what is cross-site scripting. Well, in its core, it says it all, it's cross-site scripting. So it happens in scripting languages, but it's not JavaScript exclusive. And that's pretty important to know because XSS attacks are possible in VBScript, ActiveX, Flash, and CSS, and even more than that. But yes, it's true. JavaScript happens most commonly. Cross-site scripting happens most commonly in JavaScript, I mean, of course. So what it actually allows an attacker to do is they can insert their own client-side script, which can execute arbitrary client-side scripting code, which is not good. This might happen because a developer forgets to sanitize the input. And we're going to talk a lot more about that later. But first, a little bit more about those contexts that we already discussed. So JavaScript has a lot of cross-site scripting and we're going to focus a lot on javascript in this video but again there's more options than just javascript for cross-site scripting and it's really interesting to take a deep dive into those other types of scripting languages and see how they interact with cross-site scripting i would highly advise you to do that amazing hacker so first of all cross-site scripting can happen for example in the javascript code you've probably heard about seen about that it can happen between html tags that's also an important one it can happen between the html tag attributes that's also pretty a good one a lot of you probably heard about the html tags and the html attributes i don't know if a lot of you've heard about the javascript code but it's probably a little bit more niche cross-site scripting can also happen in the javascript template liberals it can happen in the context of the Angular JavaScript sandbox. It can happen in CSS, in the headers. It can happen in so many places. It's freaking amazing. Now today we'll only talk about the context of JavaScript, the HTML tag attributes and HTML tags. First of all, the JavaScript context. I'm going to give you guys an example of code here. So as you guys can see, let me put my pointer up here. Let me get my pen. Oh no, sorry. I mean, let me get my highlighter. So you have a constant poem here. And this poem is just a little string. And you also have a constant author. And in this constant author, we're going to make a prompt to enter your name with a default of Harry Potter. Okay, simple code. Very, very simple. And then we're going to make that into a new variable. And in this new variable, we're going to add these specific variables that we already had, such as poem and offer now what might happen here is since i am within the javascript context here i might insert some malicious code into the prompt which would lead me to execute a cross-site scripting attack so we can insert a backtick in here and that's this specific character and that allows it to break outside of the JavaScript function. If we go back real quick, they use backticks. And if we insert our own backtick, then the complete JavaScript function is going to be broken. And that means we can also insert our own JavaScript code. So if we insert an attack factor like this into the code example that we just witnessed, it allows us to break out of the JavaScript function with this 
single quote. It's a back tick, sorry about that. And then we execute an alert function. Now I written alert in here on purpose because guys, alert is the most filtered word out there. Try to use something different like confirm or whatever. Make it good so that it's not as filtered as alert. I put it in here so I could talk about it, but make sure that you don't use alert. And then of course we need to put the rest of the code into comments as well so that we don't break it. Now, when we go into the HTML tag attributes, that's also a pretty interesting one. Another code example for you guys here. We have, for example, again, a prompt that's going to pop up and this variable is going to be inserted into an attribute tag. This is basically an input and this input is going to load and this JavaScript error, this JavaScript handler is going to make sure that when it loads, the value of the input is going to be the name that we entered. And that's pretty bad because if the developer does not sanitize their input properly here, we can again put in a double quote and escape what they're actually trying to put us in, which is this specific tag attribute here. So when we want to break out of it, all we have to do is enter a double quote and then we end the input tag and then we can insert our own in, uh, HTML tags in there. It's as simple as that. It allows us to execute our own ex arbitrary JavaScript code and we can break out of our input if it's not sanitized. And I keep saying sanitized because if you're a developer watching this, sanitize your input, please. And then you can also, of course, have directly HTML tag insertion, which would look something like this. For example, you have a document here with a title and then you have a like this, you have a header, you have a little script in here. It's going to prompt you for your name and it's going to set the inner HTML. Uh, now, this is an example of DOM cross-site scripting, which we'll talk about later because it sets the inner HTML here. It's going to be directly into the HTML. So we can, for example, insert a script tag in here or a image source equals X tag with an error handler in there, which would look something like on error equals alert, for example. But again, don't use alert, use confirm. So we can insert that kind of stuff in here and it would directly put that script tag in here, that image tag in here, or whatever tag we decide to insert. So we can insert our own HTML tags, make it a JavaScript executing ta tag, execute arbitrary JavaScript code, and then execute our cross-site scripting attack. It's as simple as that. And I keep saying it's simple. It's a joke, of course. I know it's not at all. XSS goes very, very deep and it's freaking amazing. That's why I love it so much. Now the XSS context in the HTML attribute, I put an example in here. I'm going to put the input image source equals X on error equals confirm. And then I'm going to put that input uh, into my document. You can use input script, for example, as well. You can use a video tag. You can use uh, so many different objects there. It's insane. Um, let's talk a little bit about the types of cross-site scripting, shall we? Now, there are basically three main attack types out there and we're going to talk about them. I know there are many, many more and I call them smaller ones here, but that's technically not correct. I should have said many, many more less researched ones. That doesn't mean they're less prevalent in the wild, of course. So maybe interesting topic for you to research, dear viewer. There are three main attack types, the reflected cross-site scripting, stored cross-site scripting, which also includes blind cross-site scripting, by the way, and then DOM cross-site scripting. We'll talk about reflected, stored, and DOM, and blind will be in a separate video. Now, as for the types of reflected cross-site scripting, what we have here is the user input gets basically reflected. It can be from a get parameter, can be from a post parameter, can be from, uh, from anything. Uh, no, that's wrong actually. It's always from a get parameter. My 
apologies for that. And then that user input gets reflected into an HTML tag or into the HTML page or into the JavaScript context or whatever. And this input, it's important to note that it doesn't get stored in the database. It's only reflected on the page. So it's also important to note that if the user input is not properly sanitized, and ooh, sorry about that guys, in this instance, that you have a problem on your hands. If your user input contains JavaScript code, then it's easily executed and you have a cross-site scripting attack factor in there. So about stored cross-site scripting, these values do get stored into the database. They get reflected from that database and get rendered onto your page or into HTML tag attribute or into your JavaScript context or whatever. And it's basically the same as reflected cross-site scripting. If your user input is not sanitized, you're going to have a problem there's three places it can be sanitized at the input, at the write to the database, at the read from the database. If it is not sanitized at any of those locations and the user input contains malicious JavaScript code, then there's a problem with cross-site scripting again, of course. As for DOM cross-site scripting, this is a separate beast in and of itself. It's really hard to look for manually. Burp scanner has a really good methodology for looking for it but manual looking is really much, pretty much impossible unless you're really, really good at this kind of stuff and you're really comfortable knowing, reading and executing JavaScript code. So what I have for you is an example here. For example, var search is a variable that we are going to store our document element by ID. This is just an identifier, just an object that we're getting. The value of, this is just an HTML tag on our page, which we're getting the value of. And then we're getting the same thing for results, document.getElement by ID. Again, we're getting that tag, that specific HTML tag. And then we set the results.innerHTML. Now that inner HTML, that's going to be our DOM sync. And that's going to be important because if we are looking at those DOM syncs, it's where user input enters the document object model, such as the eval, the inner HTML, and all of those different functions. I would highly advise you to look them up. I'm not going to go over each of them separately, but there are quite a lot of them. And most common sources of those DOM cross-site scripting events are going to be the windows.location. And this is from a port swigger research. All of this is based on port swigger research, by the way. So I would highly advise you guys to go check it out for yourself. It's amazing and very, very deep, much deeper than this course can go even. So I highly advise you guys to check it out. Now for this DOM cross-site scripting, that arises from the window.location, it usually arises from the query string or the fragment portion of the URL. Now, if you're curious what that looks like, it's like this little question mark in here and this little pound sign. We're going to look at it more later in detail, and then I'm going to tell you guys what it is exactly. So, first of all, when you're going to attack for cross site scripting, you're going to need some general advice first. You're going to be thinking, okay, Uncle Rat. What attack strategy should I use? What's my attack factor? What should I do? What fields do I attack? Let's go over that, shall we? First of all, your attack factor, that's going to be pretty important. It's going to be highly based on your context. And I've written down three possible attack factors for you guys here, but I want you to complete them yourself, of course, because this is going to be very, very basic, but you can expand on them as you go. So for JavaScript, I have a single quote, a double quote, and a backtick. Um, this is all to try and break out of JavaScript function. So if you see that your JavaScript is broken on a page, then you know that you have to investigate it further. For the HTML context, if we are looking at the tags, I'm going to first test with a really basic image source equals X HTML tag. And this is because there are filters out there and I don't want to trigger any filter yet. I just want to know if I have HTML injection and from there on out, I'll look for cross-site scripting. 
in the HTML attribute, I also have an attack factor for you guys with just single quote, double quote, and a back tick, all followed by those less than signs. And that's to break out of the HTML tag attribute. So again, if you see your HTML page being broken, it's probably because you entered one of these attack factors if you did, of course. Uh, all of these are really, really simple, guys. This is important to know. If they break the page, if I insert an image and I see it's broken, then I'm going to dig deeper and only then am I going to look very much for cross-site scripting. And I'm going to look in which context my value gets reflected. And then based on that, I'm going to look at what my attack factor can be. Now, you of course can replace any of these with your own attack factors. It's going to be important that you know what they do, how they work, and then you do a little bit of research on them. Now, for testing for cross-site scripting, you have your passive methods and your active methods. First of all, for the passive methods, it's pretty much as soon as you register, you're going to enter your cross-site scripting attack factor into every single field that you see. Now, you might be thinking, okay, Uncle Rod, do I enter it in the name and the first name and the address, blah, blah, blah. Yes, sir, into every single field that you see. Just copy and paste it everywhere. And then if these programs don't allow it, if it's, if they say you, you can't have a less than sign, for example, then what you do is you just remove it and you just go on. Don't put too much attention into cross-site scripting yet from the beginning. Just register, try to add to your attack factor wherever possible, but keep it simple. So hope that somewhere down the line, then you're, you're going to see your broken image, you're going to see your HTML page being broken, you're going to see your JavaScript being broken, and then you can look further into your XSS and hope that it pops. Now, the positives of the, this method is that they're very low effort. You're just going to have to copy and paste an attack factor into every field that you see, and then click around a little bit. It's easier though to test for hidden features. It's super, super easy this way because again, all you have to do is click around and then if you see a feature, it almost automatically gets tested for cross-site scripting if you insert that very basic attack factor in there. The negatives are though that it's not very effective. It's never specific for the situation and never specific for the scenario. Now, if you really want to test for reflected cross-site scripting, what you're going to have to do is you're going to have to test every single entry point. It's very important that you test every single point that's reflected on the page. And what you're going to do is you're going to submit a random value like this, for example, and then look it up. You know, you're going to see where that value gets reflected onto your page. You're going to determine the reflection context. And that can either be JavaScript, HTML, and into an HTML tag attribute, into your CSS, into whatever you want. And then test the payload based on that location that the value is reflected into. It's really important that your payload is going to be right for the place that it's reflected into. And you're going to test alternative methods as well. If the first payload doesn't take, then look around a little bit, think a little bit, can you maybe subvert some filters, can you maybe apply some different techniques, you know, try to think outside of the box a little bit. It's very important, guys. Now, as for stored cross-site scripting, what you have to do is you're going to have to test every location that stores user input and then grabs it and reflects it back on the page. And then you're going to have to investigate again the context in which that value is being rendered. It can be again H, uh, JavaScript, HTML, or your HTML attribute tags, or your CSS, or whatever. And then you're going to again craft your exploit based on that context, and you're going to craft an alternative exploit again if that first one doesn't fire. A little bit more about that later. As for DOM cross site scripting, this is a whole different beast in and of itself. But you're basically testing for here is you're testing your HTML things and you're going to place a random value into your source. For example, you're going to place this random value into the Windows location.search uh, value and then it's going to reflect somewhere, by the way, in location.search would look like this. This is what your location.search is. 
And if you were wondering, the query part of a URL is after the question mark. And then you also have the fraction part of a URL, which is after the hashtag sign. So that's basically it. Now, as for DOM cross-site scripting, back to that again, you're going to do a location.search. You're going to fill that with random data. And then you're going to inspect the HTML of the page using the developer tools only. Very important, guys, because the developer tools do take the DOM into account. If you right click and if you view source, that's not going to take your DOM into account. It's important to know that. So keep that in mind if you're testing for, for DOM cross-site scripting manually. Now again, Burp Pro has an excellent scanner for that. I would not test this manually if you have the option to use your Burp Pro for that. Now what I want you to do is look for your random value into that DOM then. And if your string appears in that DOM, you need to again identify the context and craft your exploit based on that context. For example, if the string enters in a double quote function somewhere, we might have to break out by using our double quotes. Now if your data gets URL encoded before being processed, an XSS attack is very unlikely to work here in this scenario. Just wanted to give this to you guys so that you know that if your value gets URL encoded, very unlikely to work. Now let's talk a little bit about filters, right? There are so many different filters out there. It's impossible to, to handle all of them, and, but we're going to talk about a few different types of filters in this course. Mainly the blacklist-based, whitelist-based, and the pattern-based filters. So blacklist-based filters are going to try to prevent you from entering a value by entering your value onto a specific list. And every time somebody tries to enter a value, they're going to check if the value is on the list. And if the value is on the list, the filter is going to block the request or going to remove that forbidden word. That's how blacklist filters work. And it's pretty good for us because if the developer ever forgets to add one blacklist word, that's pretty freaking amazing. And uh, now there's also a video on this on how to test for every single HTML tag and JavaScript handler. So if you are interested in that, I would highly recommend that you watch it. It's going to be in the extras videos. So what you want to do if you want to do blacklist based attacking is we're going to try to fuzz all of the possible HTML tags and JavaScript handlers. This is pretty important. We can also uh, fuzz all of the special characters, but that's going to be less effective. Um, if you really want to investigate your JavaScript context, you're going to have to look into it. And it's mostly going to be single quote, double quote and back tick anyway. Now, as you are working on this, you should try to also double and triple encode your XSS attack factors, single encode them, but also double and triple encode them. This is because some filters will only make a single pass through and then leave the rest of the value intact. If they do that, that's going to present some problems, of course, because that leaves us still an opportunity for attack. And if you have a blacklist, try putting that blacklist word into the blacklist word because the filter might only filter once and it sees a blacklist word. But since your original blacklist word is now split up by your inserted blacklist word, it's only going to remove that inserted one and it's going to leave your original intact again. This is pretty cool behavior. I love it when this happens. I've had it happen to me several times while doing bug bounties. Unfortunately, the cross-site scripting was a duplicate. Whoopee, I hate duplicates. We'll talk more about that later, guys. It's pretty important. Um, how to bypass a web application firewall. This is also part of the filters, like web application firewalls is a filter. Uh, you have different types of web application filters. For example, network-based application filters, you probably all run into uh, these. These are going to prevent you from inserting certain values, um, many different web application filters. Not that important. That's why I didn't include it in the slides. Just going to talk a little bit more about that whitelist-based uh, filtering that's going to be super super hard to get around because whitelist based filtering only allows certain words that are on a list and if you 
Of course, nobody's going to add a cross-site scripting attack factor onto the list, so it might be a little bit harder, but you might be able to combine wards which are on the list to still get around it anyway. Now, pattern-based is going to be a whole different beast because pattern-based is going to try and predict whether your attack is going to be a cross-site scripting attack or whether it's just going to be random noise, random talking. Um, and it's really hard to to get around those because you're going to have to know how they are configured and what they are looking for specifically. Often these are AI based, so they have a rule set, but if you are not access to that rule set, it's going to be very hard to get around those. So if you ever encounter a whitelist or a pattern based list, especially as a beginner, I wouldn't look at it too much. Blacklist filters are freaking amazing. Um, and you might try encoding your values. Now, as for raising your impact, this is also pretty important. What you can do with JavaScript is you can, for example, steal a cookie by getting that cookie, then sending it into the parameter of a GET request, make that GET request go to your own server, and then in your own access logs, you can see what the value of that get parameter was and thus what the value of those cookies were. But recently that's almost impossible because a lot of developers, guys, they know about the HTTP only flag. It's getting a lot of traction, so it's almost impossible these days. But try it anyway, you never know. Uh, what you can also do is JavaScript, so you can do anything you can in JavaScript, which means, for example, also execute a keylogger. But that is getting harder to smuggle out data recently. People are getting aware of cross-site scripting a lot more and they are preventing us from smuggling that data out. Now, a little bit more about cross-site scripting prevention measures in a different video. In this one, it's mostly about cross-site scripting itself. Uh, so what you can also do is, for example, steal data from the page. If you're on a page which is really sensitive data on it, you can steal it again in the form of a get parameter which you send to your own web server then that data will be available in your in your access logs which is freaking amazing but again it's getting harder and harder to smuggle data out you're going to have to pull out some nice tricks and that's why i freaking love xss because of its complexity and if you fail at all of these you can always just execute a javascript function on the page sometimes javascript functions are available which will execute very damaging results and that's just good for us because that means our cross-site scripting can be much more impactful. Now, it, if you know any more, of course, you have to add them to your own methodology. There are many, many more. I know more as myself as well, but I've listed the major ones for now. It's important that you know these. Thank you for watching and I'll see you in the next chapter. Amazing Hacker. Bye bye. All right, all right, all right. Amazing hackers, playtime is over. Now we're going to get into the real stuff. Whatever I taught you about cross-site scripting, it was just a basic. Because now we're going to get into the real stuff. When I was talking about cross-site scripting before, I was mostly talking about passive testing, seeing how we can test for cross-site scripting without doing too much effort. Well, guys, this is going to be hardcore, so buckle up and let's get into it, shall we? Reflected cross-site scripting, you may know what it is. It may sound very, very simple at its core, but it's not. I promise you, we'll look into that and we'll look at some test objectives as well. And then we'll look into how to test. Basically, we'll mostly look at black box testing because gray box testing and also a partly white box testing is very similar. Um, and bypassing cross-site scripting filters is something that we've went over in a different chapter as well so if you guys are interested in that there will be one in the link below so just scroll down a little bit you should see a chapter on bypassing cross-site scripting filters as for tools we'll also talk a little bit about that and it's not your usual tools that you know like xss strike okay that's a good tool but we're going to talk about some cool tools there and then the references that were used for this guide so Let's talk about what we have in reflected cross-site scripting, shall we? When we talk about reflected cross-site scripting, a few requirements have to be met. If this is not true, then we're not talking about cross-site scripting. It's really, really important that the attacker can inject browser executable code 
within a single HTTP response. That means that if the attacker inserts his attack string and he has to execute a different uh, HTTP request to get that attack string, then it's no longer a reflected cross-site scripting. Then we're talking more about stored. So, as I said, this is not a attack factor that's stored within the application. It's not persistent at all. This only affects the users who click on a malicious link or who visit the malicious website, of course, because this is not just clicking that is affected. Um, some of the attack factors, they always belong to the URI or to the HTTP. HTTP parameters, this is really important to remember. Uh, and also really important to remember is that whatever the attacker inputs, it's not processed properly, which we mean by that it's not filtered, it's not sanitized, and then it's returned to the victim in that state. Now, XSS reflected is the most common type of cross-site scripting that you'll find out there. It's referred to as first order or type one cross-site scripting by the OWASP testing guide. Uh, and the application will basically pass that unsanitized input, very important here, onto the victim. Now, the modus operandi for reflected cross-site scripting would be to start with a design step in which the attacker creates and tests an offending URI. Then he's going to do social engineering steps to get the victim to click on the URI or to visit the specific website that is infected. And then the eventual execution of the payload is going to happen on the, on the victim's browser, which will give the attacker what he wants, of course. As bug bounty hunters, we are going to stop at the design step as penetration testers as well, unless it's specifically in our assignments to also do social engineering steps. Now for proper character encoding, it's really the biggest challenge to protect against cross-site scripting. It's really, really important that the developers have encoded every single possible character that could be a problem. And if they forgot one, that's going to be a big issue. For example, the script tag here might be filtered out, but this script tag might not be. And if you look carefully, of course, this percent three C and percent three E are just less than and greater than signs. But if the filter doesn't specifically check for those, and if the web page renders them as less than and greater than signs, we might still have a cross-site scripting on our hands. As for the test objectives, we really want our testers to identify where a value is reflected into the response that we get. Really important here, the value gets reflected into the response. This means that they can assess the input and they can accept and see if they can pass around any filters. So they can look at, for example, if the filter is going to block the less than sign, they might try to get around it using the ampersand LT point comma encoding. I have a whole chapter on bypassing those filters, by the way, so if you're interested in that, go check it out. Um, but that's what we will do. We're going to identify where our value gets reflected. That will be our sync into the document. And then we're going to see in that response if we can get around any filters that are in place, if they are at all, of course. Um, we are going to test for it in several ways. Of course, you're going to test for black box, which means that you don't have access to any source code. You're just going in blind and you're going to test a lot. This is quite important and annoying, but you really have to do it. You're going to try and detect every single input factor. And this is really important that you take your notes well. Note down every single one of these because you will easily forget one of them. And if you're on a professional pen test, it doesn't look good if you're forgetting parameters. Uh, if you're a bug bounty hunter, it's not a good idea either. Um, what we're going to do is we're going to define all of those user controlled variables and parameters. And we're going to also include the non-obvious ones such as HTTP parameters, post parameters, post data, hidden fields, predefined radio buttons, selection values, 
those are all possibilities for reflected cross-site scripting guys so keep those in mind as you're testing it now you're going to when you're testing it analyze your input factor and then you're going to craft a input factor specifically designed for every single parameter now where these parameters reflect their value into what context html html tag attribute javascript that's going to determine what your attack factor is going to be like so an example for the html tag attribute would be this because we're going to try and end the tag attribute with the double quote and then the less than sign and then we're going to try to insert our own script in there now we can also try the single quote of course we can try many different things here we can try encoding these values so again you have to use your imagination and try a lot of things here you can manually test for those or use a fuzzer it really depends on you i'd recommend that you start manually and then as you get the hang of it you might have an idea of how to program your fuzzer better um, as for the html context i have for example a broken image there's also the javascript context but you guys can look at the cross-site scripting filter revision cheat sheet provided by OWASP or the chapter in this course now we're going to if we have those input factors analyzed if we have all of them noted down we're going to check for any impact so if any of those attack factors that we inserted in our previous step is going to catch then the tester will judge the impact realistically this is very important as a tester you have to be very realistic in your judgment of impact if you cannot steal cookies if there's nothing to be done on that page if there's no real reflection then of course there is no impact and you have to move on i know it's annoying and especially if you've been testing about 200 parameters but it's a good property of a personal property of a tester in my opinion that they are diligent and that they can follow things to a t so that's very very important what we're going to do is we're going to look for where those values are reflected that's of course important we're going to define our special characters that are not properly encoded a little bit more about that later replaced or filtered sometimes again developers like to use blacklist based filtering and they might forget to filter or replace or encode a value and that might be our entry point um, those codings depend on the context for example if you're testing an html context these are some key html elements that you should always test for you should test for these entities and see if they get reflected properly into the uh, response um, they cannot be encoded they cannot be filtered they cannot be left out they cannot be replaced by anything um, you can also check out this full list provided to us on wikipedia it's really really useful to look at it um, but that's a little bit outside of the scope of this course of course now what we're going to do is if we are in the javascript context we're going to have to look for a totally different set of characters and it's going to be this one because every single one of these characters is going to either allow us to break out of the javascript context that we are in or craft an attack string based on these characters so again these are a very limited list of them but these should be the major ones and you can always check out the full list for yourself now the filtering again we have a section about that in this course uh, and then we also have gray box testing which is a little bit similar to black box testing but it's not exactly the same the pen tester has partial knowledge of the application for example some javascript files or something but never full source code review uh, and then the tester of course can craft their payloads a little bit better because they might already know which values are being filtered imagine if your filter is a javascript filter well then it's easy to kind of extrapolate those uh, filterings and see how you can get around them um, 
It's also very, very important that you know about what tools you can use, of course, because you can do this manually, but there are some tools available which might help you quite a lot. The first one we're going to talk about is PHP Care Set Encoder. This one will help you encode your arbitrary text to and from 65 kinds of characters. What this basically means is you enter your text and you can say um, to uh, to car array i think it was and then it will put them uh, put every single character of your text it will put that into a character array of course there there's jsonify there's many different things that you can do um hackverter is an online tool which allows many types of encoding and obfuscation of javascript uh, i haven't used this a lot yet i will probably when i want to for example base 64 encode something i'll just look up base 64 encoder on google but it might be useful to have all of these things in one place and hack vector can do that for you and then you have xss proxy which is an advanced cross-site scripting attack tool it's basically a proxy that goes in between the attacker and the target and is going to analyze the requests Red Proxy as well, it's a semi-automated largely passive web application security audit tool. Means again that this, it's basically just a scanner that's going to statically analyze any JavaScript files. Uh, and it's going to do some uh, semi-automated annotation. It's going to look for potential security problems. The cool thing is that it's pattern based um, and it's going to look for different patterns that look like vulnerabilities. It's going to mark them for you and you're going to have to go through them yourself, of course. Then you have your proxies on your man in the middle proxies, I should say as well, of course. You have burp and OWASP SAP. In practice, I haven't found a really big difference between them, to be honest. You can use either one, you can use both in conjunction. It doesn't really matter that much, especially not for cross-site scripting. And then as for the references, really important to know, we use the community edition of the cheat sheet for cross-site scripting filter evasion. We used the community edition of the, what's, what's it called again? Sorry, I forgot the name. Web security testing guide, that was it, version 4.2. Then we have a white paper that was also in the web security testing guide. We have a cross-site scripting FAQ from CGI security. We have some papers uh, on the matter and we also have another publication so if you guys are interested in that you can look a little bit further into cross-site scripting this was reflected cross-site scripting stored cross-site scripting coming up next thank you very much amazing hackers see you soon bye all right let's continue with the stored cross-site scripting now as we said before reflected cross-site scripting is kind of kiddie play uh, sorry about that by the way i don't know why that's happening uh, we'll talk about what it is stored cross-site scripting we'll talk about the test objectives just like we did with our other cross-site scripting the reflected one and we'll talk about how to test for it like the black box testing the gray box testing bypassing cross-site scripting filters and a little bit about tools and references. So let's dig into what we have here first. Stored cross-site scripting happens when data gets stored within the application. This means that the data is persistent. If we send it to the application and call back the other get request, it will get that data for us. And this will affect any user who visits that malicious page. Now that's very, very important because that makes stored cross-site scripting a lot more impactful than reflected cross-site scripting where you need an action from the user in stored cross-site scripting you might need that but not always so that's important to know stored inputs are not correctly sanitized are not correctly filtered they're just put into the database without putting any more thought into it and that's what stored cross-site scriptings happen. OWASP also refers to them as second order cross-site scriptings and I can agree with that definition. These are the most dangerous attacks as it does not require user interaction all of the time, which as you guys know stored cross-site scripting does. There is a social engineering aspect to that which stored cross-site scripting does not have. So the typical attack scenario of a stored cross-site scripting consists of the attacker storing malicious code into your vulnerable page 
and then the user authenticating in the application, visiting that vulnerable page and maliciously executing that code. That's going to either steal their cookie, send it to the attacker, or it's going to trigger a hook for Beef, for example, or XSS Hunter. So there's many different things that you can do with that malicious code in and of itself. Uh, the design step is where the attacker again creates and tests an offending URI or an offending parameter, sends it to the server, waits until it's stored somewhere and until the visitor visits it. Um, then when the victim visits the vulnerable web page, there will be an execution of the payload on that victim's browser again causing a hook or causing something to happen which is not good that would be the default modus operandi of a stored cross-site scripting now as for the challenges they are pretty much the same as for reflected cross-site scripting the only thing is that this is also a lot more dangerous this is really important in areas where users can have higher privileges because for example if i insert my stored cross-site scripting attack factor into my blog post and an administrator reviews my blog post from his administrative panel um, it is a lot more impactful if i can steal their cookies and i can look at that administrative panel and even if i can't steal their cookies i might be able to delete some posts i might be able to edit some posts i might be able to do some stuff that i'm not supposed to be able to do so in higher privileged areas it will be a lot more dangerous and the attack is automatically executed by the browser when the victim visits it now it can of course happen that you need the onmost over event handler and then some user interaction is required but of course the onmost over you can make a pixel as big as the screen and onmost over that and then it's also done um, as for the test objectives, in this one, we want to identify any stored input and where it is reflected in the client side. It can either be HTML context or sometimes JavaScript context as well. Then we want to assess the input they accept and see if we can pass around any filters. This is really important because the filter evasion techniques are going to help you quite a lot in this. Um, this is very active hunting, so you're going to try a lot of filter evasion techniques and you're going to see specifically where your value is reflected and how you can break out of that reflection. Now, you can, of course, let's talk a little bit about how to test for this. It's a little bit the same as the reflected cross-site scripting, but there are some differences, of course. We also need to detect all of our input factors, but the, the tester, in this case, he's going to have to dig a little bit deeper and he's going to have to look at all of the specific functionalities which allow for storing values into the database and this can go very very deep for example a file manager can be happening because a, a file name can also be reflected onto the page which might also cause a cross-site scripting event um, we can have application settings which might cause cross-site scripting it can be self cross-site scripting at that moment, of course, but if you chain it with CSRF, you have an account takeover possible. Um, there is a, for message board possibility, you can read through this, guys. Um, it's most important that you use your imagination and that you find all of the values that can be stored, all of them, including file names, including weird stuff, all of it really really important then you need to analyze all of your input factors and as a tester you will try to input specifically crafted input factors for every parameter again this is much the same as for your reflected cross-site scripting as in the example for the html tag attribute we've used the same example this can be done it really depends on what your target is filtering and what not of course then you also have your html context possibility you have your sheet sheet here that you can go through and look at all of these specific evasion techniques. Then you can also analyze the HTML code. That's really important because you need to know where your stored application is going to be reflected. And it's going to usually be an HTML tags, but it can also be found in a J uh, JavaScript context. Very important to know. And the tester should always investigate out of band channels such as customer support channels, such as sales representative channels, administrative channels for blind XSS. It's really, really important and I cannot stress this enough. 
all data has to be tested by inserting in user areas and then viewing the data in the administration areas. So you're going to make a blog post and you're going to view it as an administrator. This is really important because that is where the most impactful cross-site scripting events can happen in those admin panels. You can hook your blind cross-site scripting with beef. It's pretty easy. You inject a JavaScript hook, which communicates to the attacker's browser with the exploitation framework. Uh, it's called beef. It's a really cool framework. You guys should play with it a little bit. It's uh, you can also use XSS Hunter, of course, but some companies don't allow third party hosted pop providers. So you should always host your XSS Hunter locally. Um, you just inject that JavaScript hook, you wait for the application user to view that vulnerable page, and then that hook is going to call upon your beef console and you can control the user's browser that way. And you can do stuff like grab store uh, passwords, uh, grab cookies and all that cool stuff. Um, of course, beef is going to be a lot less applicable in real life because beef is going to need to make an egress connection, which means it's going to need to make a connection from inside your attacker's network to your network. That needs to go through a lot of fireworks, firewalls, possibly fireworks cutting. Uh, it needs to go to a lot of firewalls and those are going to possibly block that egress traffic. Um, so it has a lot of caveats there. You can also just use something like XSS Hunter to try and grab the cookies but you will have to fight some defense mechanisms as well, possibly. Um, the file upload, we already talked about that name of the file might be vulnerable. So use your cross-site scripting attack factors as names of the files as well. For the filter bypassing, we have that whole separate chapter in our course. So I will see you guys there. And for gray box testing, again, it's very similar to black box testing where the tester has partial knowledge of the application, but not fully. He's not going to be able to view all of the source code. He's just going to be able to view like the JavaScript or something like that. And the tester can then better craft the payload in that case because he can look at where he syncs his values and then he can, he can, you know, adapt to that specific location. For example, if he inserts into an attribute with a single quote and he was using a double quote and a less than sign, to test for, uh, sorry, I mean a greater than sign, of course. If he was using this to test for cross-site scripting, but he notices that he is inserting into a single quote, he might switch over to that or even a back tick. There are several possibilities there. Um, the tester can then better craft his payload and it will be better for everybody. The JavaScript source file is available. If it's fully white box testing, if the tester has access to all of the source code he needs to analyze all of the locations where there are stored values being reflected into the javascript or html context um, you need to use your front end application and enter your input with special or invalid characters like the less than sign like the single quote like the double quote the greater than sign we talked about these in the reflected cross subscription section uh, and you're going to need to analyze your application response to identify the presence of those input validation controls. Um, if, for example, you input your greater than sign and you get an error, that means that you're not allowed to input that, that you need to, for example, you need to encode it with the ampersand LT point comma sign, or maybe you need to do the percent I think it's 3E or 3C, but I'm not sure. So there's many different ways to encode this, which again is going to be in a separate section. And then you're going to need to access the backend systems and check if that input is stored and how it is stored. So if we are able to store some input, we need to know how it is stored and also how it is reflected into the source code again. Is it in the JavaScript? Is it in the HTML? Where is it reflected? How is it reflected specifically? Those are all going to matter in our search for JavaScript. And that's why it's so important that you know JavaScript properly. As for tools, we have a lot of the same ones. We have PHP Character Encoder, a really useful tool. Hack Factor Verter, also a really useful tool. XSS Assistant Grease Monkey Script, which allows easier users to easily test any web application for cross-site scripting flaws. 
I am not convinced, but some people swear by it, so I would thought I would recommend it. You guys can look into it and draw your own conclusions. Then you also have Beef, which is the browser exploitation framework. Uh, really useful in certain scenarios and others not so much. Um, it's going to be mostly used to demonstrate the real life impact of your attack. Then of course you also have the Burr proxy and the OWASP ZAP, OWASP -ZAP proxy. So we have some ZAP there. Um, it doesn't really matter which one you use. Both are going to be equally good. Uh, it's just a matter of finding your groove and finding the correct tool that fits you. As for the references, again, we used the cross-site scripting sheet sheet from OWASP, really good resource. There's also a burp sheet sheet, which I will link in the extra resources file below this documentation. You can also look at the web security testing guide, which was a reference for this document. Um, you can look at some of the papers that were included as well. Those are some really interesting reads. Thank you very much for watching Amazing Hacker and I will see you in the next chapter. See you soon. All right, Amazing Hacker. So let's get on with some more filter evasion techniques. Now I'm not going to explain too much in this chapter because the PowerPoint pretty much speaks for itself. These are some advanced techniques that you can use when you're testing for cross-site scripting, but you run across web application filters. So if you have your very basic cross-site scripting here, you can add some basic modifications like a space or a tab extra in there. You could also encode those tabs. You can encode some new lines. You can encode carriage returns. There's a lot of things you can do. You can also try to play a little bit with those capital letters. And then you can also try adding null bytes. Now, all of these might evade some filters that are out there and that are, oh, sorry about that guys, that was my microphone dropping. So all of these might evade some filters for you guys. Um, some other things that you can do, if you have control over the items in your attributes over here, you can paste your attribute in here. You can try ending your HTML tag. That's something you can do. You can try doing that by just ending the tag. You can insert your script in here. You can give this like a random attribute name that might help. Um, it's possible that removing this space might be helpful because your filter might be looking at exact words input and then input slash type might no longer be filtered out. You can of course also encode that again that's also a possibility again same thing your filter might be looking for the exact word input but if you add the url encoded value in there it's not going to be uh, looking for that specifically one thing you can also do is work a little bit with quotes in it and then you can also again play with the cases now you can also try inserting null bytes both in the attribute name and in the attribute tags that's both possible so that's also an option for you and then also you can try all of the different event handlers now i've inserted this port swigger cross-site scripting security sheet sheet in here because they give you a very handy overview of all of the different uh, event handlers that are available to us as for the limiters and brackets, we can play a little bit with that as well. We can play with the double quote. We can make it a single quote. Again, we can URL encode those values. We can play with the back ticks a little bit, which are these special quote characters in here. Uh, and we can also URL encode them. Again, that's also a possibility. Then we can use double delimiters like we did with the less than sign here. Um, it might filter out to a single less than sign because your filter might only make one pass through. Um, but we can also do unknown delimiters like this one. And we can also URL encode them again. What's also possible is that we might be able to execute the eval function because, for example, alert and confirm might be blocked. Well, eval might be able to rescue us. And what it basically does is it evaluates your JavaScript expressions. As simple as that. You can do it in a normal way, like the alert that we have here. This is just an alert, but we've, uh, we've encoded the L in here. Um, we can also just make that two strings so it's no longer the literal string alert in here. You can try confirm. There's so many different options. So recommend you to be a little bit creative here um, and maybe use the cheat sheet from the previous 
slides as well that we talked about in the event handlers. Um, you can also try to directly do the string dot from code execution. This is also just going to be an alert uh, and this is going to be your opening bracket, your closing bracket and a one in there. And then you have your eval around that, which is again going to be making sure that you don't have your alert string literally in here. Um, and it's going to bypass some filters for you. You can try to put your filtered words in your filtered words, like if script would be filtered here, we can try putting script inside of script. Uh, and that might become the normal script again. This is how I found a vulnerability in real life. And there's endless possibilities and variations. It's really important that you know a little bit of what context that you're working in, of course, and that you have some imagination. Thank you, Amazing Hacker, for following this course. I hope you enjoyed it, and I will see you in the next one. Bye-bye.